Welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. I don't need to introduce everyone this week because you'll all be familiar with the guys who've joined me. I've got Jamie with me. How are you, Jamie? I'm all right, mate. Yourself? Yeah, I am doing good. And we've got Craig who's come back as well. How are you, Craig? Yeah, good. Thanks. Yourselves? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. So as we said on the last episode, and thank you to everyone who's joined in with the comments on that video and also on social media, there's been quite a bit of engagement around these videos, which is brilliant to see. We are going to cover the practical today. So when we're talking about the practical, I think we've agreed that's that's going to focus on the actual exam part of this. So your assessment, demonstrating your testing skills, rather than some of the other aspects that can be intertwined with that. So we're going to focus right in on that. Um, and we're going to run through exactly what that is. So if I can start off by asking you two experts, what actually is the um, practical assessment of this course? What does it actually involve? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll go to start with it. The long and short of it is you come into a room, you are presented with a test rig in front of you, um, and you have to take everything from that test rig, from the initial making safe elements to completing the tests in the guidance note as per the testing requirements ask you to do. And you are given two and a half hours to undertake that practical assessment to which the the assessment then says with additional time to complete your paperwork. So when we start delving into the paperwork and looking at what you need to produce to go through that process, um, we'll touch on them a bit more, but you should be given an allocation of time to complete the paperwork outside of the two and a half hours, which you get to test the test rig. Um, and in a nutshell, that is the practical. You know, you need to come in and be competent in your test and procedures with what's in front of you. You need to be doing it in the time scale that's given. Um, and you need to follow the brief that you were given. So upon arrival, and obviously I can only talk from my own centre, but upon arrival, you will be given a brief that tells you a lot of the information required for your certification, like your supply characteristics, the type of installation you're looking at and what parts of it fall under the two separate parts of the 5-2 assessment. Obviously, those that are doing the 5-0 and the 5-1 will be different in the practical, but this is predominantly around the 5-2 where you're doing both initial and periodic inspection. Okay, so that's a two-and-a-half-hour assessment. Is it sort of in a, in a booth with a test board? Are you on your own? Because I've had some messages sent in to me saying that people have done this in groups of three where they've been given a test board and told to go at it between themselves. Yeah, I saw that. That shouldn't be happening, should it, I don't think, Jamie? Not that I'm aware of. Craig could jump in. But what I will tell you is, having been around a few different trainers myself, uh, working and just v visiting, they do vary. Some are in bays, some are in booths, some are like fold up things, which I'm not a big fan of. Um, but most of them I've seen are screwed to a wall and they follow a, a layout, but not necessarily look visually the same. So don't go googling it. Is a bit of my advice for a start because you might get there and it might it might taste the same, but it might not look the same. But yeah, that thing where people are doing three. Um, as I've read the documentation our test is meant to be done, and I've never, I don't think that is a proper thing. It's a bit of an odd one, that. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's, you know, we're not here to judge other centres. I guess what we are, what we are giving on this podcast is what it factually says in the City and Guild requirements, which is it's an individual assessment, and you need to prove your competence of you testing that installation during the assessment that's taking place. So, for me, everything about that from the guidance says this is an individual assessment for you to prove your competence whilst undertaking that assessment. Is that, agree with is, that when we're talking about the boards? Is it sort of like that one that's behind me? I think I've seen yours in your centre, Craig, when I came to visit on the wheels downstairs. So is it like a big ply board with some gear on it that you would work through? Is that yeah, so what it's going to look like? Because obviously there's going to be apprentices watching this, so I'm just kind of opening their eyes to what it might actually look like in one of these test centres. Yeah, so my test boards for every different course, because every course they do is different on the assessment rig that you have. Mine are all on wheels. They're on big bits of 1,200 by 1,200 ply, and they are wheeled into a specific room for the testing to take place. Um, in our assessment centre specifically in our testing room, it's not in booths. There'll be three people in there, but each person is on their own individual test board, working on their own assessment at their own pace. So the assessor is looking at the room of three people and making sure that nothing is unsafe, shall we do say. You, 
Who are you mostly dealing with there, Craig? Is it mostly uh, young learners, college? No, a lot of our a lot of our nine one is actually to companies with on the tool sparks and kind of developing them further in their career. You know, you might have companies we've worked with before where they've had a QS model and they've decided actually they want to get all of their sparks qualified in nine one testing, so we would train them up. So our shorter courses, as we would call it, for 2391, because it's not a year-long college course, they're predominantly to industry or fee-paying adults. But, you know, if we had a student who, we wouldn't take anybody on 91 if they hadn't got at least a level three. One of the because... reasons I asked this, because one of the feedbacks I've had um, I've done with the mobile stuff is, um, Sparkies find it unnatural. You know, when it's mobile, I've had that fed back. So just be aware of that. It's something that can really knock you about a bit in, in an exam like this. So just check out your st- centre first, I suppose, is just a bit on that. Yeah, I mean, it is going to be it's going to be as close to a simulation as possible, but we need to be mm. realistic as well, don't we, with some of the space that training centres have. It is all going to be a little bit different, but just to give you a rough idea of what to expect. And, and I guess when you're in there, there's going to be some faults introduced as well. I guess you, you lecturers are the ones who can switch those in. It's the kind of set parameters we're not going to give away the trade secrets of what to prepare for but i assume you have a selection of faults you have to introduce for people's then find in the rigs yes well, the- <laughs> <laughs> there's there's 12 options basically and every center has the same 12 options so regardless of where you're doing the course there is 12 faults they are built into the test boards and it's quite plain and simple we have grid switches and we turn a selection of the grid switches on for each assessment and just so that people don't think about not saying anybody would copy, but things we've had with students before is everybody in the room will have a different set of faults on their board. So you can't hear that somebody else has had a fault one just for not giving it away. And you can't then automatically assume that you've got that same fault one on your board because we have an option of 12 (laughs) and we have a set amount that we have to set for each candidate but what of those on that 12 we do is completely our choice. So I guess the instruction on that, again, would be to read your your specification, if you like, carefully, because I assume it involves an element of kind of normal traditional inspection and testing on something that isn't faulty, and then some fault finding as well. Is that kind of written down in a sheet you work through? And I know Jamie's made a great video, actually, that's separate to this one, and I'll link it in the description to this, which kind of gives you some hints around using the test sheets if you get befuddled and I'm sure we'll pick up with that in a second <laughs> but is, is that something that you're given so you're given like an instruction sheet this is what you need to produce work through it yeah so you you ultimately so if we're talking purely five two now so the initial and periodic sorry for the codes is you are given a set amount of circuits which you have to attest under a initial verification which we know in an initial verification, it has to be, excuse me, fully compliant and working at the point of you signing that off and saying that's done. So if you were to find any faults on your initial verification, you'd need to rectify them. You're briefed on all of that at the start, so this is not giving anything away that is about the detail of the assessment. And you've got all the documentation, haven't you? I'd l- and you have all your that. certification paperwork in front of you. Something that's worth getting used to is just to interject in this is, I've, and I've mentioned this before, it's great to do a two, three, nine, two first because you'll let you'll get to experience this scenario. And I think Craig will know what I'm on about when, when I say exercising, yeah, is that this is done in a like a realistic exercise. And some people aren't used to playing panto, which is what as the as the person taking it, you're trying to do, you're trying to say, I'm gonna be a customer, this is what I would like you to do. Here's the paper I've got you to fill in. And you're playing a game. It's like it's like playing pretend when you're younger. Get into that. Get into doing that because when you ask the person doing the exam, oh, I've, I think I've got a fault here on this. They might go, oh yeah, cool. I'll, I'll come and rectify that for you. And it'll they'll act like a, a client customer type thing. That's what I do anyway. And some people just find themselves feeling a bit daft. But you're in a scenario. Play along with it and go with it. It's it can feel a bit unnatural, but it's trying to make it as realistic for you. Treat it like a real job is what I would say. Yeah, and then once you're following that, and when I say following that, there is no set order in which you have to test the regs. So it's not that you have to do the initial, then do the periodic. The remainder of the circuits on the test board that are not part of the initial, you have to conduct like a periodic inspection like an EICR. So those of us who are testing on a regular basis will know 
that if we find faults on an EICR, we're not necessarily expected to fix them there and then. We have to identify them and our paperwork needs to match that. So it is check, as Jamie says, as real life as possible. But you have to remember and listening to your brief at the start, to which I'm sure lots of centres do, but we actually give you a copy of the brief to have next to you when you're going mm. through the assessment so that you can refer back to that brief at any point to make sure that you are happy with what you're doing. And we identify in there what is initial and what is periodic. But ultimately, in the two and a half hours, you have to test both the initial and periodic and find the set amount of faults that are required within that installation in your time. And if you do that and you do it safely, you pass. In terms of the, the documentation you're filling in then, is that just the test sheet? Is that all you have to fill in? Or when you're doing the EICR, you, is it the full document with all of the observations and schedule of inspections? Mm -hmm. Is it the whole lot? You have to complete two full sets of paperwork. So a full electrical installation certificate and a full electrical installation condition report. You do not have to do that in the two and a half hours of the practical test, but you are given an extra allocation of time after to complete that. But clearly, and as Jamie says in his other video, my recommendation is that you're writing your test result on your schedule of tests <laughs> as you're going through. Because then when you go back out, you just have to tidy up your paperwork and fill in the inspection schedule, as you say, and annotate elements of the front sheets and things. But yes, to successfully achieve, you have to produce an accurate EIC and an accurate EICR set of paperwork with all the parts that come with it. I'll let people pop back. Um, I would treat it like a real sniper. So I'll say, you've done the testing, go and sit in your van, do your stuff, and then if you realise you forgot something, you can pop back and like, oh, I got the number off that or something like that. Like, like it's real life, basically. That's how I, I tend to hit it. But one thing I've got to stress here is, don't write it on scraps of paper and think you'll fill in the test sheet after perfectly because... I've not had anyone successfully do that ever. <laughs> so, out, in, out in the real world, you probably find yourself writing stuff on cardboard very regularly, as I often have been <laughs> guilty of. But when you're doing it to pass your 2391, make sure you are getting it on the actual paperwork and take a bit of time and care with it because that's something you don't want to be repeating under time no. pressure. And in and the real world, I use a laptop and I do that because I am a bad writer and I'm lazy and I get home and I'm getting a bit of paper. It's a pretty real test sheet and I'm looking at it going, I can't read any of this. I can't read anything. And that's why I have to adopt that method. But just for the two hours, just try and write your numbers nicely and get a result, write it down. Do a thing, write it down. Don't wait. You won't remember anything. Yeah, and I think, but equally, it's still not a memory test. So within your practical and within your paperwork, you are still allowed to have your guidance note. You are still allowed mm -hmm. to have your 18th edition and you are still allowed to have your on-site guide. Mm. In chapters within all of those books, there are examples of all of the certification paperwork that you are going to be completing. So familiarizing yourself with that clearly is the as part of the preparation we spoke about is what you need to be doing and saying. It's no good turning up on an inspection schedule and not knowing the the difference between two of the boxes as to whether it's, <laughs> you know, ADS or whether it's basic protection or different elements of what you're looking for and trying to work it out on the day, you need to be going and referring back to that and asking your lecturer before you get into the point of doing your paperwork. But you can have your books open and use them as a guide to help you complete the paperwork. But they're not the same as what's in the books. So don't just copy what's in there. <laughs> and it's a bit late, it's a bit late by then, isn't it, to be familiarising yeah. yourself with the test sheet. Like, uh, you should be a reasonably good, and I've done a little bit of testing. And the one, schedule the test results, people will be used to them, they'll be filling them out, although sometimes people don't spot having laid out. A certificate, I think, is a pretty simple affair. It's not anything dead complicated on there. The one way you're going to get it all wrong is, and I don't, I'm not a big fan of it myself, is the schedule of inspections is like, they're the one, when, I, when I'm auditing people, I can look at that and go, I need to look at this deep because I can clearly see it's a bodge job. Or you can go, oh, I know he knows what he's doing here. And that's the one people would because at some point before you get on the course, you need to have read all them and gone, what does that actually mean in English to me? What yeah, am I looking for? People tend to go into tick mode, don't they, and just fly down <laughs> and tick every box. 
yeah, and it's like the first thing that will catch people out is, all oh, right, because obviously I think, is it box number two? Oh, so you've got a generator on site, have you? No. But what you ticked all this for then? So it's dead easy to catch you out dead quickly if you just go tick crazy. So speaking a bit about that then, how is this actually marked? And again, we're not going to give any secrets. Where is there like a total mark of allocation? Is it you assessors in the centre, I assume, who decide if someone's met that mark or not? How is it actually graded? So there's not a set mark. It's quite simply a pass or fail based on is it completed in line with the installation that they are looking at? And yeah, that, it's a warm and fuzzy thing, isn't it? I would say it's like there are criteria. I mean, there are there are fail points. There are things you, you can't not do. There are things that have got to be done. But as you could have a dead good test sheet, a dead good certificate, and you could think, you know what, that guy's not ready, or that girl is not ready. You can you, you can make that decision because ultimately, again, it's on you. And if they go and kill themselves next week with off a board cover, it's on you. So if they've managed to do it, but it was a complete finger and thumbs thing, you might like to say, look, do you want to come back and have another go? It's all it's not. It's not on and fast. So if you don't do good at the start as you roll into it, but you improve as you go through, don't think you've already now you've finished it off. If that makes sense. Well, the key the key element is competent, right? We are having to confirm you are competent. So if you are following every test page by page through the book and don't know how to do the test, or you're unsafe, are we going to say you're competent? But there's not. There's not a you need to get 30 out of 40 marks. It's a, com- are we happy you competently tested that reg and understood what you were doing? And that, mm. just so there's no ambiguity to that, that is standardised or should be standardised in all centres across all assessors who are involved in the delivery of that qualification. So it should not matter who you are in front of. The outcome should be exactly the same. What I would say is do your research from the centres that you're going to because I'm aware of centres where that bit where it says assessors can give additional time for paperwork, some centres will not. Some centres will. You need to look at your course and your centre you're going to and what impact that may have on your assessment. Mm, if, you're dyslexic, sorry, if you're dyslexic, if you something like me, yeah, let them know. Um, like, because you'll get give a bit more time. Say I'm not great with our writing. Make sure you chuck that in as well, because you should get a bit more time for that as well. Good shout, that Jamie. So if you do have any kind of special requirements to do with your um, learning techniques, I'm dyslexic as well. Make sure you do speak with the lecturers at the colleges, because they will usually help you make allowances for that. Um, so don't be struggling if you um, are finding mm-hmm. that difficult. Speak to the lecturers in the colleges. And I give tipex time as well. I never ever. I give you one set of test sheets. I never let people rewrite them out because they look fake. So I give Tipex time while the Tipex dry so they can go and fill things in after. Because uh, I don't like to see perfect test sheets because I think they're always fraudulent, to be honest. <laughs> so, so you get more time off that for me. So is it, is it essentially like a, a driving test then is something I would best describe mm. it as when you're out with your examiner doing your theory. There's, they've got the, the little list they need to tick through and there are things that would be an instant fail. I assume you have things like that as well. If you see something, somebody doing something especially dangerous, you know, I guess there's no way back from that. Um, but as as Jamie said, you know, sometimes you can make some minor mistakes and there is a way back. You can still pass the, the exam like you could your driving test. Is it is it similar to that-ish? It's exactly that. And you are allowed to seek clarification from your assessor as well. So, and that is allowed. We're not allowed to tell you how to test, but you may turn around and say, I can't remember. You know, I can't remember if this circuit was on the EICR or if it was on the installation certificate. We are allowed to prompt you and remind you of where they are to give you clarification. So you don't have to sit in a puddle of stress. Mm. Um, and effectively, apart from it being a bigger installation and apart from it being under more of a time constraint, it's no different to your level three. So the fault finding you've done at level three and the in- initial verification you've done as part of your level three course or your apprenticeship units, this is the same principles and the same process as those assessments. So nobody really is coming to 2391 with the first time of experience in this type of environment or scenario. It may have been a while, but you have experienced that environment and it is conducted exactly the same way. Just treat that assessor like the pretend customer. Um, I've had one instance where someone didn't do something at the start because something happened in the room. Uh, someone knocked, you know, the plastic flute tester boxes. 
someone knocked one off a table and this lad went, uh, he lost his train of thought. And then when he realised what he'd done, which was quite a serious fail thing at the start, I'm sure it won't take a genius to work out what it is. He come up to me and says, I haven't done this. And I was like, yeah, I know you haven't. So I, he said, I said, do you want to stop? And we'll start again in an hour, which we did, because I felt it was unfair that this thing had happened um, that had really knocked him off. But in real life, he could have still injured himself, but he came to me and says, I've got it wrong. I know I've done it wrong. So I, I had to sort of wait up and I thought that that was a fair crack. But you need to make sure you're comfortable with that flow and you're just doing it naturally. It's all going off. If something happens, stop and go, right, hang on. What's happening? Right, where am I? Right, I carry on. Always just revert back to stop. What am I doing? Da, 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 da. And off you go again. Don't start getting more flustered, 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 flustered like I see people do. We're not, I've had someone go out crying before now, but that's the thing you got to be, forget all the tests, forget all the electrical stuff, just controlling yourself, your brain, your thoughts and what you're doing at a time and organising yourself is, is important as well, I think. Yes, yeah, so I guess the, the assessors or lecturers are going to be looking for kind of confident, methodical work. And the best thing you can do if you're not in that mental space yourself is to just stop. Just give yourself a minute or two to think. It's the same thing. You've prepared in the best way. You've got the books there to help you. Rather than ploughing on and making a mistake while you're under a bit of stress and pressure, give yourself a little bit of time um, and make sure you're happy to move forward with that next phase of whatever it is you're doing. I would say if you're a competent tester, you are testing that rig anywhere between an hour and a half to two hours. So you have mm. about 30 minutes to an hour to control yourself, to just have a think, to just make sure if you're not sure, rather than trying to rush through it. Manage your time, take the circuits that you know that you can do relatively straightforwardly. And as you say, following that methodical approach will keep you calmer. Yeah, and, and we've already said you're allowed to take your books in. That's one of the things I had on my question sheet that I've just got to, but Craig said earlier on in this, you can take all of your books in. So reference back to those if you ask, if you're struggling. Um, in terms of the overall cost then, so we're speaking about the whole thing here, what sort of percentage of the cost itself is based on this particular exam? Is this like half the cost Ooh. itself? You know, what would you say it's weighted towards, if you like? Uh, the the The... the... But, sorry, Jamie, the bit for me is it's, it's not weighted because no. you, there are three tasks that you have to undertake in the assessment element and then the online exam. And you have to achieve each of those three tasks. You can't miss one and pass. You have to successfully pass. To get the qualification, you have to successfully pass the online exam, the practical that we're talking about now. You have to effectively pass the photo identification pictures and you have to pass the short answer questions. All of the pictures and the short answer questions and the online exams have set grade percentages to achieve to get through those elements. The practical comes down to does the assessor believe you are competent based on their experience? And I would say don't look at the assessor. They're not there to fail you and they're not the enemy. Most of us have spent all day, every day, for however many years, assessing students. We understand you're nervous. We understand that you're in what we call white cloak syndrome. You know, the second you enter that room, it makes you a bit more on edge. Like, we know all of that. We know that things will happen. Just work with it and take your time. Obviously, not too long, but take your time and <laughs> work your process through because... If you adopt that approach and you work with your assessors and you are safe, you'll be okay. It's a well-rounded approach, and that was kind of what I was I was digging at because some people might think, well, I'll revise the exam aspects, so the theory exam, nail that hundred <laughs> percent, and then when it comes to the practical, I could squeeze through with twenty percent there. You need to be uh -uh. well-rounded in all areas to get through this, so you need to be preparing in every single aspect if you want a successful outcome. It's not something where you can excel somewhere and be rubbish somewhere else. You've got to be hitting that benchmark all the way through. It's not and plumbing, it's, Mark. It's in plumbing. It's <laughs> <a> sparking. <laughs> but it's because of the responsibility, isn't it? And yes, in one regard, this is a course, which obviously it is. But if you pass that come Friday, come Monday, you could be testing somebody's house and you could be solely responsible for signing off, saying that that installation is safe. I know there'll be comments about you should be shadowed and all of that over time. And I get that. And I get that that's an ideal scenario. And I agree. Everybody should always have that. 
But let's just say on the off chance that isn't possible in a company, somebody could then be going and testing an installation, an office block, a house, wherever it may be, they need to be competent to do that because that's what we are saying you are okay to go and do. Yeah. I say to lads, oh, sorry, I say to lads on the first day of the course, yeah, whatever job you're going to book in to go on test next week when you finish this course, make sure it's a few cheap ones because you ain't making any money on the first five because you'll be there and it'll feel like this exam again. You'll be going through books and working out stuff works and that. And I think five or six tests in the real world, you start getting to the flow, but don't book any big ones in for Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday next week because you won't make any money if you do. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those, isn't it, where you need to be careful as you pass these courses. You're still going to, if you're, I'm thinking of a young apprentice who's maybe just out of the time, so they're no longer apprentice going on this course, you're still going to want some supervision along the way as well. That guidance, if you can get it, don't just jump straight out and start testing three phase factories after you've done your two, three, nine, one. And remember, this is not an instructional course, it is assessing your competence and knowledge and i'm going to kind of pull that back to the best t- tips aspect and i think it's going to be quite boring again because i'm just going to repeat myself <laughs> that it's it's in the preparation so it's it's preparing in the right way um in terms of your, your testing maybe familiarize yourself with working on rigs so if you have access to a college still go and have a look what the rigs are like as jamie and craig have both said where you're doing your course go and visit them see what it looks like prepare yourself in the best way you can if you're lucky enough to have some spare gear knocking around, make yourself up a little test board and practice some in some fault finding and working through test sheets. So that's kind of been my best suggestions. What what would you say, Craig? Mine would be if you don't feel you're hundred percent sure on the testing for the practical element, go and do a testing course because there are lower level testing courses, but the two or three nine one is not that. So if you feel mm-hmm. you've been, and this isn't just to apprentices, people have been testing a long time. If you think you may have picked up habits over time that you're not sure if they're allowed, go back and do a testing course for a few days just to familiarise yourself with it before you then go back into your 2391. Jamie? I've wrote down here, I, I'm 40 years old, yeah? I've been in the game 20 years and I still ring people for advice. So like I said, it's not, it's a course it's not, it doesn't mean you're totally competent. If you get somewhere next week and you're like, oh, I don't want to do with that, get the book out and ring someone. And the other one is, which is dead good to me, is, um, and I'll come to myself next, the meter. Find out what meter they're using. Ideally, take your own or borrow one and familiarize with it because you need to be, you and your tester are at one, yeah? Um, when it says something, you need to be able to have total trust in it. If you want to watch some videos... Uh, some what I would call advanced videos where someone who's totally in tune with the tester, the David Savory one's the one, he's, he looks at the numbers and tells you why it's going off. You need to feel like that about your testing. You need to feel that it's giving you the right numbers and that you know what it means and you know it's on the right set, you know the leads are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the last bit for me is I'm not a bastard. Um, I'm not out to fell anyone, but I'm not out to make any widows either. Yeah, um, the, and, and most lecturers I meet are like that. We're not out to fell anyone. Um, but I'm not out to kill anyone. If you don't perform in the test, you won't pass because you're not competent. I don't want to go and kill yourself next week, but it won't be because like, well, it might be because you've been tossing it off all week, but no one's out to fail you. We work to a, a, a piece of paper that tells us what and you can and can't do. And if you yeah. don't pass, don't take it out of the assessor. Just stop and think what you could have done better. And they should feed you back. But yeah, um, I don't pass anyone who I don't think you're going to do the job. It's I like that good. shout about the meter. We should have probably mentioned that earlier on, actually. So if you can familiarise yourself with as many test instruments as possible and speak to the centre where you're going to see what test gear they use, because they all are different <laughs> where the leads get plugged in. It, it can confuse you if you're not used to it. And I, I won't um, upset Rick by saying this, but I know he had that issue when he did his AM2. So different to the 2391 where it was a test set he wasn't familiar with. And the way it carried out a certain test wasn't how he was expecting it to carry it out. So make sure you are familiar with the test gear. That's a brilliant shout, Jamie. I'm a fluke, man, but mega, what the fuck? How do they work? It's like it's like having a meter with everything on the front written in Chinese to me. I've not got a clue how they work. I can't operate them at all. So be aware of that. <laughs> like, if you get then it's it, all meters that are commercially available usually work, but some of them work in wonderful, wonderful ways. And I, I can't use a mega, and I've been doing this, 40 years, uh, 20 years. So be aware if you've got your own shit or your firm use something and you get that it's the wrong thing, don't do <laughs> it. Don't take your own. But you can take your own test meter and you can use it for the assessment. The only stipulation is we have to see the calibration certificate before you're allowed to do so. 
Brilliant. So, so if, if you do have your own test set, you can take it in with you and, and use that. So it's something you're going to be very familiar with. So that'd be that'd be my option, I think, if I was going in to do my two three nine one again, I'd be taking my test set with me. I've done a little Alex as well. I did it. Uh, you spoke about one. I've done the checklist. I've done a little Alex these series. So I've done checklists, and I'm just finishing one off now about different testers and Brilliant. adapters, and have a lead into mingle because there's some great adapters that are provided by the college I was last working at for the two three nine one. Um, a round commando style one with banana plugs in. And you know the three pin um I know what technique you ones, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Don't hate me, mega fans, but the, your leads don't fit in them properly. Yeah. <laughs> ah, they Someone, do if you turn them around. There you go. This, I knew there'd be a trick to it, but in the <laughs> test, in the test, people get flustered. Fluke test leads are the best test leads on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. But just be aware, something like that. Don't want to be firing out in your exam, do you? You want to know beforehand. So yeah, there you go. There's a, there's some I've learned tonight. No, definitely not. And I think just on a final point for me is that listen, Dave Savory's videos are good. If you need something a bit more college type style, then I would recommend going and watching Gary Hayes at GSH Electrical. He's got a whole testing series that takes you through step by step in line with the books. He's never swore though. What? <laughs> Doesn't swear <laughs> at all. Can't watch that. No, really. It's really good. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Gary's an absolute beast. I'd ask both of the guys to recommend some online content, and that's one of the names I've got on my list. We've already mentioned the John Ward videos earlier on in this series. So there's loads of stuff on YouTube you can go and look at and kind of familiarise yourself with the process involved, but you'd be very hard pushed to find anything more thorough than Gary has got on GSH. Mm. And um, Jamie's going to put his videos out over the next few weeks. He's already got one out now. I'm going to link that in the description to this video so you can go off and check that out as well. Hope you're finding this useful. Is there anything you two would like to add before we wrap this one up? Just don't rush it. If you're not ready yet, be honest with yourself and do what you need to until you are ready. You all good, Jamie? We've not told you anything in this video at all, and that's the way we wanted it. Yeah, exactly. all we're here is to point you in the right direction. If you start Googling 2391 test rigs, which you will get test rigs pop up, and if you start looking for ants and that, when you get in there and it doesn't look the same, or it doesn't taste the same, or well, the test sheet's a bit different, you'll shit your pants. So don't spoil it for yourself by trying to find out what's going off. You should be able to go on any job and assess what's there and what work you've got and make it work for you. So don't try and cheat on it because when you get in there and it looks completely different, you honestly will shit your pants. So I've seen people in there go, that doesn't look like a test for a guy I normally use. And then they go, oh, well, yeah, and, uh, you know what I mean? It's a mess. So don't cheat. It's the worst thing you possibly do on this game. Only cheating yourself. Mm. thank you both again for coming on and to people who are watching if you've got any questions drop them in the comments on the description of the videos we're all keeping an eye on those and we'll respond same on the social media stuff i'll tag the guys stuff on twitter and instagram you can go off and ask them questions on there as well we'll be back with episode four in about a week or so thanks again gents and we'll can see I do you a on preemptive the mark can i do a preemptive that um, i know we, we i think we're go going for, for five i think we're going for five we'll talk about after if anyone's got anything they'd like us to answer as a question on this, that would make a good episode, I think. So ping them across to Mark or whoever, because I'm sure people start there going, what about this? What about that? So if we can answer them, it'd be nice to have something to do, like a bit more interactive on the end. Yep, good shout. We can do that. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you on the next video. Take care. Thanks, all. Bye-bye. Don't kill, don't kill yourselves.